Good afternoon, I'm Michael Kessler. I'm the Managing Director of the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs and a faculty member in the government department and the law school. I have the distinct honor this afternoon of welcoming you to this conversation on when does protecting faith imperil children, which is both an important and crucial topic and also um, the result of a new volume published by Cambridge University Press, which Robin Fretwell Wilson, it, uh, our distinguished guest today, is uh, the editor of. And we're delighted to have um, this opportunity to discuss the issues. Um, joining her is um, my colleague, um, Catherine Marshall, professor of the practice in the School of Foreign Service and a, a world-renowned expert in religion and development. Um, and um, Rabbi Ambassador David Saperstein, who uh, is both a longtime Georgetown colleague and also most recently was the ambassador at large for international religious freedom uh, during the prior uh, presidential administration uh, through 2019 you served, or 2017 you served into 2017. Um, this is one of the many kinds of topics that the Berkeley Center treats um, and, and uh, perhaps in many ways is one of the most important lenses through which we think about our work, um, how religion interacts with policies that are set in both domestic and particularly in foreign and uh, policy and in global affairs, and how innocence and uh, those who are most vulnerable are impacted by those policies. Um, with that, I have, um, the opportunity to hand it over to um, David, who will give more extensive introductions of the people. So thank you for coming. Thank you. That works. Michael, thank you. Um, and thank you for your leadership here. You've done really a fantastic job, and we're all deeply appreciative for your contributions to the Berkeley Center. Um, I want to welcome everyone here. Uh, we're going to have a conversation. It's small enough uh, a gathering that it can be a little more informal than it might be. So we're looking forward to engaging with you and having you engage with our two really remarkable um, speakers who are here, um, uh, Catherine Marshall is a bit of an institution here, leading the work on religion and development uh, is something she's devoted her life to, uh, her 35 years at the, uh, at the World Bank, her playing the key role in launching the uh, World Faith Development Dialogue, uh, uh, dialogue between faith leaders from around the world and influential faith leaders around the world and um, the, uh, and, uh, the in the development world um, uh, and it really has had a significant impact and she continues um, to lead that. Um, I, I'm fond of saying that I, I travel very widely and one of the most common things I hear is, oh, Catherine Marshall just left. Um, no matter where across the globe I am and uh, her presence is uh, so remarkable in that regard. She's been, in, uh, she's edited and written in a number of uh, uh, publications, uh, the research work she guides at the, the substantive research work she guides as part of World Faith Development Dialogue and the program here um, is really unique and made a significant contribution. And her, uh, her uh, uh, she um, helped uh, uh, edit a, uh, a book with Susan Hayward from the uh, uh, Institutes of Peace, U.S. Institutes of Peace on women, religion, and uh, peace building, um, and uh, a book on uh, global institutions, um, uh, global institutions of religion uh, in terms of the role that religious groups play in the international affairs and uh, development work. Um, uh, Robin uh, Fretwell Wilson uh, is, uh, this book is in no small measure
um, due to her enormous talents. Not only is she written in it, um, but she edited the book, one of two major books, the one next to the other one's even larger um, than this in the same year, um, uh, two of the 11 books that she has written or, uh, or edited. Um, she produces books faster than I read them. Um, and uh, and the level of uh, that she has done really has been uh, extraordinary. And obviously, the contested place of religion and family law is directly on point um, uh, to this uh, to this work. But as well, this year the other book on religious freedom, LGBT rights, and the prospects of a common ground um, was a remarkable achievement that she did with Bill Eskridge from uh, Yale University. Um, I, I have to express constantly my own debt of gratitude for her guidance for the piece that I produced from that. She was just a wonderful mentor to um, uh, be, be working with in this. Some of the toughest issues to deal with are those that paid valid moral principles in tension with each other. And in the whole world of religious freedom claims versus civil rights um, protections, uh, these issues uh, are significantly at play in Europe, in the United States, and growingly across the uh, across the globe. Um, a, a, a one discrete area of this that uh, poses uh, particularly vexing um, challenges to us is in the area of family law, because there you have family legal issues, the right of privacy of families, the authority of parents to decide on uh, the upbringing of their children that also intersect with the uh, uh, the religious freedom claims and the uh, protection of children, civil rights claims um, that exist there. So uh, we couldn't have two better people to reflect on some of these uh, issues about how to balance out these competing valid moral principles, these competing uh, claims here. And this book makes a really significant contribution. So Robin, why don't you lead us off, tell us a bit about the book and some of your own contributions. And again, just thank you for the work that you've been doing. A little shorter than Michael. <laughs> so, um, thank you so much. It's a privilege to be with you, David and Catherine. Um, I have to say, I've been really blessed to have such amazing colleagues. David, hardly did I mentor him. Quite the contrary, I learned quite a lot from you in doing the afterward in such a compressed period of time after Masterpiece and while our book was on track for publication by Cambridge. Um, and Catherine um, and I have only met recently, but for but like you, David, for many, for many, many conferences and for a very long time, I've always heard, how is it that you don't know Catherine Marshall? I have no idea, but I'm glad that I do now. So, and um, I hope this is the first of many collaborations. Thank you also, Michael, for having us at the Berkeley Center. It's a real privilege. Um, loved your poster, so whoever in the room was responsible for that, I, I ripped it off for the first slide and I really much appreciate it. And the, really the question is, is exactly this, when have we gone perhaps too far in the direction of protecting religious claims so that the consequences are actually visited upon children, with, whether that's intended or unintended, so that's really the question. It's a question that runs across the book, so I'll spend a second on the book before I drill down in particular on faith healing as one instance of these clashes where we have both constitutional protections of the family, constitutional protections of religious freedom, and then we have the welfare interests of children who aren't in a very good job, position to protect themselves, obviously. So the book comes at a moment, I was saying to Christina Ariaga at uh, lunch, that was right after Hobby Lobby and just after and before a Obergefell is when some of the early writing was being done. And if you think about it, you have cross currents in the law at that moment. You have Hobby Lobby giving more robust protections, arguably, to uh, religious folks to live out their religions in important ways, their beliefs in important ways. Although, of course, you know, cabined by uh, the state's compelling government interest, right, which in many instances we'll see with faith healing might be protecting the children who are parts of these families. Um, and then you have, you know, a Obergefell, which for many religious folks, they sort of experienced as losing hold on an important family tradition, a form of important religious institution for them, marriage. Um, I'm not sure that I see that issue quite that way, but I think those cross currents were very much there. And so part of what the book is trying to do is make sense of those cross currents, but in a particular context, I think, 
that for most of us, exercising our belief is most central to us and our families. Arguably, our churches may be more, uh, our houses of worship, uh, if not um, uh, churches uh, necessarily. But, you know, the family, I think, is the place where it just paid put, right? You either can exercise that belief or you cannot. And we'll see that a lot of what the state has done, at least in faith healing, has erected a very thick shield around the family uh, for reasons that, um, you know, uh, you know, date back to the 1984 child abuse amendments. I'll come back to that in a second. And then we're slowly trying to rethink whether maybe we've made too thick a shield around the family. This book actually looks at all of the kinds of places where we might ex uh, expect clashes between the state's interests, um, the family's interests, and the you know, third party interests. You might think of the children as separate from the parents in that particular regard, across the life cycle of a family, or across the life cycle of individuals from birth to death. So there are lots of pieces in the book that are about Hobby Lobby itself, from both perspectives, very balanced. So both people like Mark Rienzi, who litigated Hobby, Hobby Lobby, to people like Michelle Goodwin, who's been one of the leading critique, critics of Hobby Lobby. Uh, there are pieces of the book that are talking about clashes. Oh, and, and also it, not just these kinds of issues um, around the beginning of life, uh, but things like religious male circumcision, which uh, for many communities is a kind of existential claim, you know, in order to be belonged, you know, and to be part of that community, you need to be, uh, you know, religiously circumcised in this particular way. And then the second part of the book and third part of the book are sort of talking about the middle of your life, right? So child rearing, real, really interesting, you know, difficult questions about homeschooling, for example, which we'll see intersect with how hard it is for the state to protect children. Uh, from instances of medical neglect because those children are not on the state's radar, they're homeschooled. So there are a set of uh, questions about that. People like Peg Brennick writing about religious uh, values at divorce and how families try to reflect those and the decrees that they enter into. Uh, and then there are a set of writings about religious values at death, in particular Naomi Khan and Amy Zietlow writing, uh, who I think Amy was your, um, was your classmate, Michael. Uh, she reminded me of that this morning. But uh, writing a really interesting empirical study about how religious values matter at death, uh, and finding in particular that the values that seem to matter are religious, but they're the decision maker's value as opposed to the patient's, which is really interesting, especially for people coming from a bioethics perspective, because that's not what the law would have otherwise suggested would happen. So that's the architecture of the book. Uh, in the book, I have sort of two pieces, one that I won't talk about except to mention, which is the, the thrust of many lawmakers in the United States after Obergefell to, quote, get the government out of the marriage business, you know, to withdraw from marriage. Uh, and I sort of suggest that that may be a fool's errand um, and not quite the right way to go. Um, and then uh, a piece about faith healing that I had the privilege of doing with my co-author, Shakira Sanders. And that's going to focus, uh, be the focus of this talk. So we think all the time about sort of exemptions from the law around vaccination. And you can see on this map that basically every state in the United States, with the exception of uh, West Virginia, Mississippi, and California. Let me say that again. West Virginia, Mississippi, and California, usually not in the same sentence, um, saying, no, we're not going to exempt you from vaccination. All the rest of the country, not just exempting religious belief, but exempting folks who have philosophical claims as well, so who are the anti-vaxxers or just don't want to have their children exposed to this or for whatever reason. And these are very easy to pull down on. Paul Offit, who gave us a chapter for the book, um, drawn from his own substantial writing across two books about this, reminded us in a lecture that he gave at the University of Illinois that 30,000 children have not been vaccinated according to the CDC's numbers. Now that's by itself a significant sort of shield away from, uh, uh, from society and an otherwise you know, uh, neutral rule that would be applied to people. I think 
to some extent, when the trade-off is, you know, do I vaccinate my child or am I, you know, doomed forever to hell, this is a pretty easy trade-off right, for lots of these families. I'm not saying necessarily societally, but they are going to take a pass on vaccinating. Far more complicated, I think, is actually when we are saying to families that they're exempt from the duty to treat the child for ordinary disease that we could reasonably predict will end in the child's death. And you can see from this map that we have lots of different variants of state laws, but the over overwhelming uh, rule is to exempt religious organizations. You see those in blue. Um, some of those will limit that uh, in white to an exemption for a recognized religious group, which might by itself be problematic that you're only allowing recognized groups to be exempt. I'll leave it for our USCCB colleague to, to tell us more about that. Um, some will have a, a um, judicial bypass so the ones outlined in black actually have a process for judges to authorize the care when the family cannot. Okay, we'll see when I drill down on Idaho in just a second how difficult it is for that judicial bypass actually to take effect and to, to be protective of children. But that's one way of moderating. You may have your belief, but these children won't be harmed. It's hard to do in practice. Some of them you'll see uh, exempt um, the family who chose not to treat from being prosecuted for manslaughter. Idaho is one of six states that does that, so I'll use Idaho as a case example. And then some give no religious exemption at all, as you see here. Now, what we have seen in just the last, let's say, two years, is a number of high-profile deaths across the country, not only in Oregon in a particular uh, community of the followers of Christ in Michigan with a couple who um, is uh, an evangelical couple, and then I'm going to talk about Idaho and in particular the followers of Christ there in just a second. So we had a tragic death in Oregon, really interesting because Oregon uh, for a long time did not prosecute uh, the followers of Christ when they chose not to treat. Um, interestingly enough, this couple had twins that were born. One of the twins survived prematurely. The second had, it appears, things that would be able to be aspirated out of its breathing passage. Um, they were in this home with 60 followers of Christ crammed into a little ranch house where I think it would have been very, very difficult for the parents, even if they had wanted to treat, to be able to do that, given the tremendous context. I mentioned the number of people in the house because you'll see that there are mandatory reporting duties in just a moment. None of these people picked up the phone and called 911, not one of them. Those deaths continued in Oregon despite the fact that they had had uh, something like six years earlier, uh, a very similar death, um, and the couple here, pictured here, had received the harshest sentence yet uh, in the history of the church. In Michigan, we had a couple who um, had a child who had a completely treatable uh, disorder. Uh, they didn't treat. Uh, in part because the husband seen on the left said that God makes no mistakes, and when he was asked pointedly why you know you haven't, um, why you didn't call 911, uh, he said that he was praying. Now the state has actually done something in an anticipatory fashion because the same same couple is now having uh, another child, so they've gone in as a matter of the normal abuse and neglect laws and removed that child from their care. Now query whether we can remove all the children from all of the followers of Christ's families. But that is in the ability of the law to do because the only thing the law has to show is that a child is at imminent risk for substantial harm and they have to show it more probably than not. So there's a whole child abuse and neglect system that could possibly be um, deployed to protect these children, but again, a very difficult problem because where, you know, it's a question of whether we take every child from every family and, and particular communities, which I think is hard to believe. Now, I pause and mention a second child death in Michigan at the same, about the same period of time, because I want to be clear that this isn't just religious families that are not treating. There's a man here who um, didn't treat his daughter. Uh, who died basically emaciated uh, over a period of weeks 
uh, was very coarse in reporting that death. He first called his attorney, then he called 911 and said to the dispatcher, she's dead as a doornail, right? And this obviously didn't play very well with the judge. His um, explanation is that he distrusted the state. He was worried about having his children taken, but it was not a religious explanation. And that brings us to Idaho. Idaho is one of six states that is not prosecuting families, and in a particular county, Canyon County, the death rate for the children in that community are 10 times what it is for the rest of the state. Now, um, they have looked at the Peaceful Valley Cemetery and calculated the number of small mounds, right, child uh, deaths, and it appears that there are at least 600 child grave sites in the Peaceful Valley Cemetery. And you see these small coffins being unloaded here as one of the sort of efforts to get Idaho to actually change the structure of the law to preclude this kind of outcome. They walked all of these child coffins down from one part of Boise to the State House um, in a very long, silent parade. Now, one thing I have think we have to focus on when we think about whether we're going to intervene in a family to override their views about faith healing is whether the death is in fact preventable. So this is a study that was done by Osser and Swan. It dates back to the late 1990s, and it looked at a 20-year period during which there were 170 children who had died from faith healing or the choice to pray over the child instead of treat medically. 162 of them on the left would more probably than not have survived. Out of that, 146, 90% chance of survival. Another uh, 16 would have more probably than not survived. Only 10 were likely, based on the medical record after the fact, to have died whatever happened. So for the 10, we should be leaving these families to grieve should leave them to grieve. But for the others, we have a live question about how the state can move to protect that child without just trouncing on the religious beliefs of the family. Now, Osser and Swan did something else. They broke out non-cancer-related deaths where we can have greater confidence that the child would or would not have lived. There, they had 96 of 98 non-cancer deaths where they concluded uh, that the child um, had a very good, excellent chance of surviving or would likely have survived and had a good outcome if they had been treated. Interesting, those gives you the percentages of, you know, preventable deaths. And this was true also in um, the, the um, communities that were in Oregon practicing faith healing. The Oregonian, a number of years ago, analyzed all the deaths from 1955 forward, found 78 children buried in the church's graveyard, and by looking at medical records and, and you know, instances, case histories of what happened, concluded that 21, now that's a smaller percentage, that's like a third, right, but 21 would have been saved by medical intervention. Now, part of the problem, as Paul Offit makes in his chapter here in his book, Bad Faith, is that sometimes the families themselves are conspiring against the state to keep the child from being protected. And a good example of that happened in Philadelphia, where medical examiners presented to homes where children who had not been vaccinated for measles were dying. Uh, look in the door to ask about another child, told that child is fine, and then only within you know a day see that child showing up at the morgue. Clearly could not have been true. Now part of, I think, the problem is the eyes and ears that we have in communities. So we have mandatory reporting laws, you know, in the United States, but those mandatory reporting laws often place duties on people like teachers, social workers, parents and guardians, and some of them, like Idaho, put this duty on all people. But in those states where we're asking social workers, teachers, you know, to be our eyes and ears, and that population is almost exclusively homeschooled, there is no sort of, you know, early warning system to say that a child is potentially suffering. And that's the key problem. It's a problem of insularity at the end of the day, as opposed to 
Oh, something else. Clergy are, um, are, are covered in a number of these states and have duties. And a set of states, you'll see with the, the hand, with the circle, actually place this duty explicitly in the code on faith healers. But query if the faith healer is the one in the community telling you that you shouldn't be doing this, whether the faith healer is going to be a terribly good mandatory reporter in that particular instance. And you can see Idaho there. Now, I think Idaho has a specific problem. They're being defeated by the structure of their law, and I'll show you that in just a second. But they, because of the structure of this law, they are one of only six states that actually preclude you from even prosecuting, it would seem. Uh, families for withholding. Marcy Hamilton, who's done amazing work in this area, you know, believes that there's going to be just a time where we're going to rise up and say that children shouldn't be suffering. I think the problem is harder than that. And the problem is harder than that because of the laws that date all the way back to the 1984 child abuse amendments. Paul Offit in the book talks about the influence of two Christian scientists in particular in getting the 84 child abuse amendments to encourage states to give this big shield around religious belief, in particular medical neglect. So the way most of our quote, exemptions work, is there's a positive duty not to do something, that's the big circle on the left, and then a carve out from it on the right. Well, the positive duty that other families that are not religious would have in Idaho is one not to willfully cause or injure their child or to put them in a situation where their child's health is endangered. And if they do that type of thing, they're subject to imprisonment um, in the state prison, for example, not less than one year and not more than 10. But then there's this carve out, and this is where the beginning of the problem is. Um, it basically says, but not if you have engaged in prayer or spiritual means. If those are the only things that you've done, those themselves can't be used to show neglect. Same thing here, the state has a duty to protect children, carved out from that, is but when these religious protections exist in the code, the state doesn't have that ordinary parent's patriability ability to enter into the family and act. And then you take these and you stack them up. And basically, there's a criminal prohibition and a carve out for that spiritual belief or prayer. There's a crime not to abandon or, or, or fail to support your child, same carve out. Then there's an applied defense to manslaughter. And the reason it's there is that basically, the reason it's implied is the state has to show criminal injury from an unlawful act. But the unlawful act were the two prior things, which were made lawful by the exemption. And so you have no unlawful act. Um, and then continuing, the judicial bypass, the thing that should allow the state to come in and authorize the treatment that a child needs if it learns about it, even that has the same carve out. And that is a problem. So this is actually like that, remember the Jenga blocks that you stack them up and you pull out like this one piece? If you could pull out that one piece, that one initial uh, exemption for religious uh, spiritual treatment or prayer, then these other things would fall into place and you would have the ability, in effect, to take those two pieces out and then to have this, uh, the rest of that scaffolding, the judicial bypass and absent that prosecution in place. And we don't have that because of the structure of it. And this is the last point that I'll make. This is a problem at the end of the day of insularity and the capacity of the state to act. So Alexander Redito was a child who was in Canada, uh, he had completely treatable diabetes, uh, comes to the um, attention of the authorities in one part of Canada, and they intervene in the family. And for a time, he's fostered, he gains weight, he's doing really well. Uh, but that family then moves from there to Alberta. The foster care system doesn't pick him back up at that point. He falls off their radar and he's found emaciated with gaping holes in his body, completely treatable, dies at 32 uh, pounds in a closet, and it was completely treatable. Now, I think where you land at the end of the day is we can just stay where we are, and we're going to have children who are dying. Or we can try to do the Jenga move and pull out little provisions, like in a place like Idaho, and prosecute. 
But I think we're gonna have a problem of some of these families going to ground like Alexander's did and literally moving away from the state's con control and authority in a way that's not going to benefit all of those children. Or I think we can try to engage those communities, which I think actually means to be more omnipresent in them, as insular as they are. Because without eyes and ears in these communities, other than the community themselves, I don't think we have a hope of actually helping these children. And I'll end on that note. Well, this fascinating and I think disturbing presentation by Robin is the main course uh, here. And I'm not going to try to comment on it. What I wanted to do was to broaden the agenda somewhat to the international perspective. Uh, and what I'm mainly going to do is to tell you a few stories from recent conferences that I've been at and some of the issues that we're grappling with. Uh, one thing that is is interesting, it will be a, f uh, a topic, a central topic at the G20 Interfaith Forum, which will take place in Tokyo uh, in June around the G20 meeting. And one of the focal issues will be celebrating and exploring the 30th anniversary of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, where I have to say with great embarrassment that the only country that has not ratified that now is the United States because Somalia did ratify it, so the United States is now completely isolated. Uh, the, in, in discussions, and as many of you know, my, my mission has been basically to start with the development agenda, which is, in the contemporary world, pretty much everything, uh, because it, in, it does not only involve poor countries, the sustainable development goals cover all countries, uh, and the notion of development is now, it would be very difficult to find any topic that would not in some way fall within, uh, within that. And trying to say, what's religion got to do with it? Why does it matter? Uh, and what does that mean in terms of policy? And one thing that is very striking is how often the issues and the tensions and the concerns of people about engaging with religious institutions turn around issues of gender and family. Um, even if you have a, a discussion about religious topics, and I would have to say, particularly when you have an all-male panel, the issues of women and family may not come up, but they're underlying that. And so, Another sort of agenda and request for people to think about it and give us ideas is that we have a lot of interest in doing more work on these areas of religion and family. But just I thought I would take four, four conferences that I've been at recently uh, and one other issue that sort of involves the law. So first conference um, was uh, in December, the Ouagadougou Partnership meeting, which was in um, Dakar this year. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the Ouagadougou Partnership, it is a nine-country West African alliance that's focused on family planning. And the nine countries are Francophone West African countries, which have the highest fertility rates uh, in the world. It's Gates Foundation, therefore very disciplined, very technocratic, with a big element of competition, which country's doing better. Uh, they all start from an incredibly low base. Uh, but two of the major constituencies there are youth, because the problem of family planning is to a very large extent with youth. And there's a growing recognition that the religious actors are very important. They're very important partly because they are the most influential uh, by you know, polls and surveys and so on, but they are also part of the problem. Uh, so for example, uh, there is a not an insignificant strain, particularly in Muslim communities, but also in others, uh, that uh, family planning is a Western plot to limit the size of the Muslim population. And therefore, there's uh, a lot of um, social media, uh, radio, et cetera, which is direct opposition and feeding conspiracy and to some extent feeding fundamentalism. 
uh, and extremism, which we, we obviously worry about. But there was an interesting, they, there is this recognition that you have the youth constituency, so you have lots of young people come with, you know, t-shirts and, you know, raw, you know, that l'heure de la contraception est ici, you know, est arrivé, it's time for contraception for all. And they put some of the youth leaders up on the stage with the religious leaders. Uh, and I don't know what they think is going to happen, whether they think that the religious leaders are going to say sex among unmarried couples is fine. Um, but the basic outcome that I was hearing from the religious leaders was we're about to hit a wall and we're going to be out of this thing because the whole problem of religious communities dealing with changing values and mores in the society is a very difficult one. Uh, and I think the most sensible conclusion, which uh, the religious leaders we work with have been coming to, is probably least said, soonest mended. You know, just let's just leave that aside and deal with child spacing, um, and let's deal with even child marriage or girls in school, which is the be the best solution to um, a teenage pregnancy. Um, let's not even get into the weeds of what you teach in sex education and how you do that. But I was very struck by what looks like a collision course uh, that seems to be brewing in West Africa. So that's conference number one. The second conference was a meeting on the sustainable development goals that was the va at the Vatican. And it was largely the dicastery on uh, human development, uh, a sustainable development, but it was also organized with UN agencies. Um, but just one little vignette, uh, one of the religious leaders who's present in a lot of meetings is a very colorful, very dynamic guy called Swami Agnavesh, um, who um, he went to town. He deals with bonded labor issues. He's been in jail, he said, 11 times. Uh, he, he's a fighter. Uh, and uh, Swami Agnavesh was, w went initially really to say, look, religious leaders have to take responsibility for issues of caste. But then he came and said, well, you know, the problem is religious institutions. This is a religious leader in his full orange garb saying the problem is religious institutions. And then he said, what I think is that no child should be part of any religious tradition until they're 18 and old enough to um, make their own decision. And I wish I had a photograph of the faces of people in the room. Um, the sort of this idea that children should not be basically identified from birth as with religion and that they should not be uh, taught about it. I thought that that was, uh, that was an interesting one. Um, third, um, there are some very interesting initiatives going on around um, issues of children. It clearly, it, the, one of them is the Global Network of Religions for Children, which is actually supported and sponsored by a group called the Argato Network, which is a Japanese uh, religious um, community, which has really just decided that their mission in life is to try to put the issues of children onto the global agenda. So one of their, their actions is large conferences. So they had a very large, ambitious conference in Panama um, about a year and a half ago. Uh, which was on pr pr basically violence against children and which did end with 12 sort of religious leader commitments to ending uh, violence against children, um, and which are pretty sensible and they're really working to follow up. So they do some very interesting work, the network, including ethics education. But one of the things that struck me, there were, there must have been five, 600 people, I don't know if anyone else was there, but almost every speech talked about family. And there was absolutely no sense of what that meant. Um, everybody had a different meaning of what they meant by family. Uh, and I, it, it, was, it was very striking. It was within the same, you know, Methodists or Baptists or Catholics or whatever. This understanding of what we care about, what we mean by family was so diverse within a group that was religious people focused on the protection of children. So I don't know whether a conversation is necessary. I'm not sure a conversation or a dialogue is going to be very helpful. But it is at least, I think, useful to realize how wide the divergence is in understandings of family. So my fourth meeting, and the last one, uh, was yesterday. Um, I was at the United Nations, uh, where what's happening now is the Commission on the Status of Women, which is two weeks of meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting, 
Uh, and as you can imagine, there are not very many that have anything to do with religion. Um, but I was at um, one which was actually eight women, which was a big panel, too many, uh, very, very diverse, and we were looking at issues of social cohesion and um, essentially our own experiences of working as women within the patriarchal structures of the religious worlds. Uh, but we had a dinner beforehand, and there were um, two vignettes from that. One of them just as a, I put out as a, as a sort of, I must say, enlightening for me, uh, that one person who was there, Joyce Tubensky, said, well, you know, I, I was just told by my staff that there are 27 uh, gender identities right now. So anyway, needless to say, I started Googling right away. Um, but the next morning, someone said, no, 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 uh, the mayor of New York officially recognizes 31, but there are also things that say 57, 63, 71, and 112 that I found in sort of five minutes of touring the internet. Um, so the issue of gender identities is obviously a very complicated and interesting one, shall we say. Um, we were trying to figure out what, what really was, was going on here. But I think the more sobering is the sort of basic message that's coming out of this right now um, commission uh, on the status of women is that there is a strong backlash against women's rights and women's equality, uh, whether it's reproductive health rights, the whole kit and caboodle right across the board, um, and there is um, the reports, the Guardian has an article today uh, that is being led by the um, Obama administration. It's clearly, this is countries, let's remember, it's nation states. But the identification of those nation states with religious um, bodies is very clear. And it's described as the unholy alliance, which has for some time, going back to the Cairo conference, uh, been basically the Vatican, the Catholic Church, um, and uh, relatively most conservative uh, Muslim countries, but it's added to now clearly by many evangelical uh, churches, but also by the Orthodox. So Russia uh, is very much part of this. And the sense is, what is it that they're after? What is it that they're afraid of? It's clearly something we need to understand, um, and we need to to engage, uh, but those are those are very big issues, uh, and they they cut right across the agenda of issues for us. Which, just to give you an idea, are child marriage, um, where I think religious communities have a special responsibility because, in many cases, most cases they marry people, so they could do something about it. Uh, the whole female genital cutting issue is is a very big one, which also raises the issue of law and the implementation of law. Um, issues of family planning clearly are very central. Um, issues of um, uh, uh, selective abortion uh, of girls, particularly, I think almost exclusively girls, um, and issues of custody, uh, issues of divorce and support, uh, and domestic violence. Uh, all of those are high on the agenda, uh, the gender agenda, uh, internationally, and they're not unrelated to the fascinating and sobering topics that Robin raised. So, thank you. So, let's, uh, it, let me start uh, posing a couple of uh, questions based on your presentations here. When you talked about um, legislation that engages these communities, could you help people think through what that might look at, what some of the indicia of it might um, might be, and is there an example that you have in mind of where this has been tried with some success? I wish I had those answers. That's a great question. Um, let me go back for a second. So there's a remarkable man who was the Senate Majority Leader long time in Idaho, Bart Davis, who before becoming the U.S. Attorney tried to to do the Jenga, you know, pull that piece out. And he ran into the fact that their incredible Western, you know, individualism in Idaho, no surprise there, ran into the idea that the state has a Religious Freedom Restoration Act. And so would we be, by taking a specific exemption out for a particular kind of religious practice, run into a second value. Um, 
And I think to, to some extent by engagement, I mean sort of two things. One is you could assure people that they will be able to abide their belief, that they will not themselves have to treat that child. While at the same time, the state can fulfill that role for them. And I know we have some folks from the you know, Kennedy Center here, and it may r ring a bell for many of you, but long before we started thinking about the followers of Christ, the early ethics cases about non-treatment were Jehovah's Witnesses. Jehovah's Witnesses didn't want to receive blood products, and it might actually imperil their life or the life of a child if it was a child who needed that. And there were a set of judges a long time ago who would take it upon themselves to authorize the blood transfusion for the child. And at least one of those judges in the literature talks about how relieved the Jehovah's Witnesses' families were, that they themselves were not the instrument of that for their child, but their child lived, right? That's the judicial bypass. And if perhaps you could pull out that one piece of Idaho law that's a specific exemption that's cratering the ability of the state to do that, but leave the Religious Freedom Restoration Act there for people to be secure in the idea that they would be able to follow their beliefs or practices when the state did not otherwise have a compelling interest, maybe that's a place to land. And Senator Davis, to his credit, really took a stab at doing that in his last go. The other part that I mean about engaging communities is that we are going to have to have more contact with the community. And I think that then is just straight up child abuse and neglect. So it's our ordinary dependency proceedings to, to, to take a stronger look at families uh, and be sure that children within the sort of black box of the family are well. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, means if you have, a, have communities that are disproportionately homeschooling, we've got to have some way to be engaged in that community, whether that's, you know, more community resource officers or something going on in that community so that we're aware when children are in need. Let me ask a couple of related questions here. Um, one of the great controversies going on today is in the adoption foster care uh, arena where uh, the question of whether or not uh, service providers, um, either licensed by the state or funded by the government, um, are entitled to discriminate in terms of who they would uh, judge a fit um, a couple to um, uh, to adopt someone or to serve as a foster uh, parent. Obviously, the South Carolina Miracle Hill um, exemption given by the uh, HHS um, has put that on the uh, on the uh, on the front burner. Um, and I I presume people gathered here have followed some of these controversies. Might want to just say a minute about them. Um, but I want to push a little bit on the question of whether or not in deciding where to place a child, that whether the best interest of the child includes continuity of religious upbringing that would allow for preferential choice um, to go to a, uh, a particular uh, family um, who is of the same religious upbringing as the uh, as the child, and just indulge me a second. So I want to push a little bit. At what point does a child become old enough that the child's wishes should be accommodated um, in this, even if the let's say in a foster care the the parents didn't want it um, uh, here, and uh, the agency doesn't actually serve what the child's choice, the families of the child's choice. It begins to get kind of, of uh, complicated here as to what, and it wraps back to the question about faith healing. At what age does a child become old enough to make some decisions for themselves? Is it at majority at 18? Um, should there be a lower standard? Should it be a, a, judge, a judgment of the judge? Um, whether or not the child is old enough and mature enough to make a decision? So I want to get into this question of when the child's 
uh, judgment and wishes on some of these issues come up? Well, that's a lot. I think my students would have said that's not just complicated, that's a hot mess. So um, let me start with the last part, though, and you may have insights to this, Catherine, from, the, from all of your work in the developing world. But we had a case like this in Virginia, the last part. When is a child old enough to decide for themselves? And one of the reasons that I emphasize preventable versus non-preventable deaths is it was a case in which a young man had cancer. I think it's the, the law that Virginia passed is called Alexander's Law, if I have that right. But it's a kind of a smash up between a mature minor rule and um, a faith healing protection. And it went like this, Alexander did not want to be treated for his cancer, he was dying thought that he might go to Mexico for a particular kind of treatment, but didn't want aggressive chemotherapy. And when his family supported him in that decision, he was 16, as I recall, the state pounced on him and treated it as if it was the faith healing deaths that we've been talking about in Idaho, like preventable deaths. Um, and long story short, the Virginia legislature passed a law called Alexander's Law that says that when a child is mature enough to decide for themselves and the family supports them in that, then the state can't use that as a reason to intervene. Now, I think we do want, um, we have that in the body of family law. We have mature minor doctrine. So, you know, the rule of thumb generally has been when a child gets to be about 14 and there's an ordinary divorce and uh, the, the, the judge asked the child, which house would you have a preference to live in, mom, dad, or mom and mom, dad and dad, whoever, uh, the child can say that when they're a, quote, mature minor. It's just sort of the same concept, right? So I think we should have room to defer to children, um, not least of which is in the child marriage context when these children don't want to be married. Um, but that's hard because they remain a dependent of the family. So their interests, unlike Alexander's, their interests and the family's interests diverge. Uh, in Alexander's case, both of the family's interests and the child's interests diverge from the state's and I think should have been given credence. So I thought the state got that right. Going back to Miracle Hill, everybody know the Miracle Hill story? So this is a, okay, so I'll tell you a little bit about it. So it's an adoption agency that does amazing work, has placed hundreds and hundreds of children in the upstate of South Carolina. They're evangelical, uh, Protestant, I think, um, and they wanted to place people only with families who believe in Christ um, and going to have a Christ-centered sort of upbringing. And a Jewish couple presented to adopt and were told that they would not help them. Now, this sounds eerily familiar to many people in this room because the same sorts of clashes have been happening with LGBT couples who have presented. And I'll just give you my, I'm gonna disclose my conflict of interest here. I'm an adopted child. So I have a real, real trouble with turning any family away that wants to take a child into their care. That's my bias, that's my prior. But in this area, I've actually been working for the last couple of years to try to get to two principles that I think can both be affirmed in public policy. One, no couple that wants to take a child into their care is ever humiliated and turned away with government dollars, period. And then two, these religious agencies that are doing amazing work, and they are. They're drawing forward people from their religious faith communities based on their religious tenets that they are not forced to close. Now, most people just eyeball that and say, you can't have both of those. you got to pick one or the other. It's not so. That's not so. So for a long time, we have allowed families to direct themselves to um, the people who are going to take care of their child with early childhood development. You know, we give folks a, cer a certificate that they can spend at a Montessori. They can spend it with grandma. If grandma's the best person to take care of their kid, they can spend it at the Catholic school. They can spend it at the Lutheran daycare, wherever they want to go. And all of those places have to agree to accept the certificate. But 
the fact of the certificate doesn't operate to change the kind of training that they're doing with little kids. So the Montessori doesn't have to train like the Catholic school. The Catholic school doesn't have to train like the Montessori. Now that's worked through five different presidential administrations from Bush one to Clinton, you know, to Bush two, to Obama, to Trump. Been explained differently as family choice in some instances, as charitable choice, and you know, religious folks not being discriminated against in another instance, but it's man managed to work. The entire thing hinges on better information about the different niches that different agencies work in. There are lots of agencies that are gay friendly. We need to let people know that. There are lots of agencies that are specializing in Jewish couples. We need to let people know that so that we don't have disappointed expectations and we don't have people being humiliated. Um, and it importantly breaks the government money, government rules connection. Then it's people directing themselves with value that they get from the state. Far harder is the first question you posed, which is the kid. So are we gonna strand a kid in foster care? So I, I have no idea who my birth parents were. I'll just give you an example, okay? But, my parents who adopted me kind of adopted me when I was at the edge of being unadoptable. Okay, I was almost a year old at a time when like people got adopted pretty quickly. So let's imagine that I had been Catholic. My mom and dad were Methodists. Our, my mom's still alive, but they were Methodists. What a cruelty it would have been to strand me in foster care even longer because my parents who wanted me were Methodist. Now on the other side of that, there are faith traditions that, you know, there's a badge of identity and belonging forever. And I don't know how to weigh that, but I do know how much being adopted by my family changed the entire arc of my life. So I think if we're gonna do that matching we're going to take that seriously and try to flow through a child. We should certainly do that in a private adoption agency system where a woman who is considering abortion in the background of her mind or adoption, if she's more likely to bring that child to term because she knows it can be adopted by a Jewish family if she's Jewish, a Mormon family if she's Mormon or whatever, then God bless it, let her do whatever she wants, right? I think that is great. A kid who's taken from their family because there's a rupture, and which might have happened to me, we have no idea. That one I really, really don't want to strand unless we are positive that there are lots and lots of families to adopt. And I think you had something to add, maybe? Comment. Uh, briefly, so I just had a couple of comments. One, on the issue of maturity, I think it's Again, we have to remember that in a number of traditions and societies, women are never mature. Um, and they're, they never have the option of decision. So uh, the question, I mean, <laughs> the first thing that I learned when I, in way back in the days I was working on agriculture and, and livestock was the basic phrase with cattle, with cows, is when she's big enough, she's old enough. Um, and I mean, that seems to be an attitude. Um, but but the fact that women never have the respect of the uh, of their decision, I think, is important. Uh, the I was reminded of big debates at one point in Malaysia when I was there, and one of the issues, big issue is orphanages. That's a big public policy issue. And that has strong religious connotations that's being played out in a number of countries uh, with a lot of tension around it. But there, the question that I, I found in the newspaper is, if a child, a baby is abandoned in a church in a majority Muslim area, is there an obligation that that child be raised as a Christian? Or if they're abandoned near a mosque? Mm -hmm. I mean, it was this, this issue of the religious identity has such a grip that it is rarely escapable. Could we spend a couple of minutes, ask the two, and then we'll open it up to uh, the others here. 
about, you have a very strong chapter on male circumcision that was very interesting and patterns of what's happening around the globe. You spoke about female general mutilation, uh, FGM here, um, very compellingly. And I, I, let's talk about a, a little bit about distinctions between the two um, uh, here. One you indicated to you was pretty clear, and I think both of them, if I'm inferring, would be pretty clear, but in different ways. Um, uh, here, what is your sense of what's going on globally on some of these issues? And uh, uh, here, in terms, is there progress being made on this issue? Clearly, there's religious resonance, but much of this is also tribal-based and culturally based, um, as well as uh, having a religious uh, basis. And uh, these are practices that aren't necessarily found as normative in religious traditions, but are very common in specific areas. Um, uh, here, what is the way that so, so these issues are being um, uh, addressed? Is there success being made? This crosses over into the child marriage also that has uh, very often cultural tribal uh, roots as much or more than it does religious roots. Could you reflect on what's going on um, in, in these issues? I know far less about FGM. And I, I'm also going to yeah. ask, is Christina still here? Christina is. And uh, I was, she is. I, I'm going to ask you also to jump in. You've been looking at the FGM issue a little here. I'd like to hear your take as well. That was what I was going to start with. I know far less about that than either of these two. I will just make a plug for being an academic, though. One of the things that I love the most about my job is the privilege to work with people like Eric Rosbach, who wrote the specific chapter, who's at Beckett, by the way, who wrote the specific chapter on religious male circumcision, because I get to study at the elbow of a person you know, while I'm working with them, like we did on, on your afterward. And one of the things that I, uh, that I took away so clearly from Eric's chapter is this debate about whether prohibiting male circumcision is needed for public health reasons, okay? In much the same way that the faith healing chapter preceded, or my work on this, I think if you could find a strong case that this was really, really, really bad for kids, then you might try to override the religious view. And as you're, you, you are absolutely right, it's not only a religious view, but layered on it, ethnic and sort of senses of community by belonging. And they layer, and I feel like until you get such a strong public health case, why would you ever try to step over that uh, strong, significant interest in the community? Second thing that I took away I absolutely believe is that it may be a profound cruelty to a child to take the possibility of religiously male circumcising from that family if it is in fact a badge of identity and belonging because then you're denying that child that child's parents from cementing their relationship to the community. That's the way I understood it. Now, there are far more people, maybe folks at this table who are members of the community who know better that than I do, but that was the distinct sense that I had. FGM, I'm still educating myself, so I'll be interested to see what, what the two of you have to say about that. The FGC issue, which affects you know 200 million is the current estimate, um, and it's been remarkably persistent. I mean, there's a unanimous UN General Assembly declaration against it. There are many countries which have laws against it, uh, and yet it, it persists. So it's clearly a challenge to understand. Uh, but the um, it, it also is a very vivid example of the complex line between culture and religion. Because whereas there are clear religious teachings about male circumcision, there are none that are clear and uncontested on female. But you know, if the local pastor, including, by the way, the bishop, let's be clear, it's mainly Muslim, but it's also the bishop, think that it is required by the religious tradition, clearly that's what influences people, and that's why they do it. Um, sort of, so um, a couple of comments on that. One of the things that complicates the female circumcision debate, female 
gen mutilation, cutting, the, the language is all very, very subtle, uh, is the trend towards medicalization. So there the argument is, okay, taking a razor blade to a baby and cutting off her genitals uh, is dangerous, cruel, barbaric, and is a word that you often see in the discussion. Going into the hospital under anesthetic um, is a different set of arguments that you need. You basically need arguments that this has no benefit whatsoever and has harms. So the whole sort of argumentation. But then the question is, how do you argue that with people for whom it is their identity? So your last argument made me quite uncomfortable because, um, because that is, um, is the issue. And then, you know, again, you could argue the same thing with male circumcision. What is it that led to that? Was it sort of distinguishing one group from another 10,000 years ago? Um, what was it with female genital cutting? It seems to be pretty clear that it's designed to reduce female pleasure in sex and desire so that they don't, so that you know better who the parent of your child, who the, who's the father. Uh, I mean, it comes down to very crude um, understandings of women's behavior, which we heard in a mosque near Washington not very long ago, um, that that was the reason why you had to do it, because otherwise women were wanton and, and so forth. Um, what was the circumstance where that discussion happened? Um, there was an imam who gave a sermon that basically supported female genital cutting because it was necessary in order to keep women's sexual desires under control. And that was dangerous to the society, et cetera, et cetera. And he was temporarily um, suspended, but then apparently came back. So the debate continues. Christina? Well, certainly I'm here with the experts on the topic, but uh, thank you so much for including me. Uh, that case in Virginia was super interesting because it happened here, and what he said is to prevent our women to becoming hypersexual, like American loose women. But uh, very few people know a lot about the details of this topic because, frankly, my husband calls it a conversation killer of all time. And I think it's important to educate the medical profession, nurses, about this Right now, in the United States alone, there are half a million girls at risk. And what happens is these immigrant communities, both Christian and Muslim and animist, and from many different religious backgrounds, who believe that is their religious obligation, take their girls back at age seven or eight for vacation cutting to their country of origin. Now, there are four types of female genital cutting, according to the World Health Organization. Some are considered minimal. Some involve infibulation, which is the removal of the entire outer layer uh, of the, the labia and the removal of the clitoris. The first kind is under litigation right now in Michigan, in the United States. Uh, there were two emergency room physicians who were running an FGC practice for a small Shia Indian sect called the Dawoodi Bora. And they cut um, two seven-year-old girls. The case has gone to trial. And the judge uh, decided not to pursue the FGM uh, case because the decision was made that Congress did not have the authority, because there was not inter-commerce trade, to make FGM uh, illegal and a criminal act in this country. So to me, what is most dangerous about the Michigan case is that the lawyers for the doctors hired Alan Dershowitz, who said this is a benign religious protected practice. So religious freedom has been used in many weaponized ways in the last 20 years to then weaponize it in a way that is damaging to girls. Uh, to me, damages certainly the girls, certainly religion, but also religious freedom in this country. So it'll be an interesting case to, to watch. Thank you. Let's open up to those of you who want to ask any questions, make any comments. While you wait, can I just make one pitch? We have a very interesting podcast that's on the Berkeley Center webcast, which is basically about the FGC issue in the United States, including the way that it it is and is not regulated in different states, with Sean Callaghan.
very helpful. Someone want to start us off here? Okay. Anyone else? Christine. I just had a general question. Um, do you think that uh, some of the issues, we're possibly the most pluralist country in the world, um, some of the issues in the United States have to do with a lack of religious literacy? I mean, just to give you an example, I was uh, recently in uh, Saudi Arabia, and the control officer who was with me uh, did not know about what a Baha'i was. And there's a religious community that suffers great persecution in Iran and other places. And very nice man and very dedicated to his job and immediately researched it. But if our foreign service officers lack the religious literacy to deal with religious freedom topics uh, abroad, do you think the fact that in this country in schools, um, people don't know enough to know the difference and are coming into these communities that have these what you would think of unconventional practices with a certain level of prejudice. Have you encountered any of this in, in academia? That's a great question. I don't know that it is religious literacy when it comes to some of these sort of things that are ending in a child's death. I think people, now, whether they're not willing to engage the community because they just feel like there's no point in engaging the community. That might be a religious literacy question, I would think. I think when you get to the, these, these practices that are having you know, extreme consequences for children, I'm not sure that's a literacy question. I think when you get to other things that might be about dress and modesty, um, and then I think contraception, that's a, that would be a great example. Then I think we have we have a lot of concern about religious literacy. You have more to add to that. Just, you know, just uh, th there are some limitations of what you can do because of the range of religious groups, sets of beliefs in the United States. You you know, sociologists tell us we have as many as a couple of thousand different religious denominations, sects, et cetera, and it's kind of bewildering to us because we're most Americans are part of the larger. Um, religious groupings, and they don't think about the smaller ones um, like the followers of uh, Christ. They, they don't interact with them. They don't know about them, uh, et cetera. To actually do in the public schools of the United States sensible education about faith groups that would entail acquainting people with the diversity of some so many um, different sects it would be just an enormous challenge. We have enough trouble teaching about religion rather than teaching religion, but teaching about religions um, in civics classes and uh, in social studies classes um, uh, without getting into controversies and arguments over misrepresentations and stuff. It just would be really daunting to do that with the kind of range that we're talking about here. Got the question formulated. Yeah, I'm ready now. Yes. Good. Uh, uh, could you identify yourself? Oh, uh, Steve Lipson. Uh, I'm interested in your use of talking about like uh, judicial bypass as a means of possibly compromise. And as you also noted that, I mean, potentially that would either, like the state would need to know about these cases, which could either be more proactive looking into the community or potentially a mandatory requirement for clergy to report these things. But both of those strike me as things that the community themselves might not feel engaged. They might feel it's more state oppression. So like, is there, like, what would they like least? I mean, which of these would they dislike least? Or is there a way to actually truly feel that they're engaged and supportive? Uh, and sort of the question that might or might not tie into that, but, like, you mentioned that these, these issues used to be with Jehovah's Witnesses and now are more for, like, now other groups. So I'm wondering what happened to Jehovah's Witnesses. I mean, did they, like, was there a change in their religious beliefs or approach or added to the state so that, if these aren't as important, prevalent questions in that community now, why is that so? Well, that's a great question, both great questions. Let me take the second one first. You know, I think it actually follows the set of beliefs. So it turns out the Amish don't want to take, I think, some sort of, some certain types of transplants. They don't want to have transplants. Um, there are, there's been a long history in the Jewish uh, faith, as I understand it, um, not to have 
some interventions. Autopsy comes to mind in yeah. some instances. So I think with the Jehovah's Witnesses, the, the, the issue is smaller and more modest, right? And that we found ways medically to actually allow folks to follow their belief without it imperiling the child's life. So to some extent, you know, it's a kind of victory of medicine over, you know, to both accomplish the end and not override a belief. So I don't know, you know, this is a really tough question about the community itself. It makes me think about Christina's question about literacy. I think engagement means that people need to sit at a table and see if they can understand where each is coming from. And I do think there's a, a sense of, in when we don't know anything about another person's set of beliefs to be very xenophobic and the sense of, you know, that's wrong as opposed to asking folks, what are you able to do? Um, it again brings to mind that, that uh, particular decision with a judge talking to a Jehovah's Witness um, in one of the blood transfusion cases where in conversation it comes out that the parent can't make the decision. But that doesn't mean that the child would be forbidden from heaven if they received that blood product. Now, that may just have been that particular Jehovah's Witnesses view. Uh, it may have just been what came out of that conversation with the judge. But there was a middle ground that was between the child dying and the, the parent, you know, uh, making, you know, taking a, 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 um, an action that would put in peril, you know, the rest of their eternity. And I think that's the way forward. I think this is a real question for sociologists as well as legal scholars, lawmakers, politicians, everybody, because that community <coughs> is just continuing to pile up child deaths and they, they are preventable. So we're gonna have to have that conversation. That's where you're going next. Um, I, I actually- um, Hold on one second. Oh. Hi, um, I'm Farnaz Ispahani, and um, I'm a fellow at the Woodrow Wilson um, Center. Um, I wanted to go back to, you talked about that um, one of your recommendations was that for um, people, groups to be more present in these faith-based communities um, to protect children and children at risk in these ways. How could you do that without, what are the government agencies? How can human rights groups, media, different kinds of groups work together and work better on the ground? Well, one thought is um, Alexandru right, whose family moved from Calgary to another part of Canada, and then the state just lost track of with, them. With the intent of disappearing. Right, they were yeah. running, they, yeah. were, they were going to ground. Um, but, you know, to some extent, the, you know, to the extent that the parents work, right, we have like Department of Labor, Department of Labor can be having conversations with the Department of Social Services, because if you can't track that child, you can track the, the wage earners in that family, right? So that's one way that you can have interagency cooperation. In the family in Oregon that um, had demonstrated to the state and were being prosecuted for not treating uh, one child, you know, the state learned that the mother was pregnant and then anticipatorily took that child at birth, right? So that's another place where the state can be omniscient, and what I mean by that is just on it, like thinking ahead uh, about what we would predict would happen. I mean, to some extent, more touch points between a community uh, and the state. So there are county coroners who are actually often called to these homes after the child has died. Shakira and I talk about it in our chapter, and they've bundled the child in the way and, and dressed the child so that you know, if there was evidence of a crime, it's all been disturbed uh, and that type of thing. But there are coroners in these communities. There are, there are, you know, first responders like police and fire people in these communities. I'm not saying that we're going to start, you know, knocking on doors and interviewing families, but just having people aware, you know, of what's happening with these children. 
Let me, uh, we have uh, seven or eight minutes left. Uh, let me just ask about another hot issue these, uh, uh, these days. You mentioned about the Jewish community uh, and the normative view in Judaism shared by every stream of Judaism is you must do everything you can to save a life. And therefore, medical interventions are mandated um, in order to save a life if they're required. The only place you run into trouble really has to do when saving a life involves two different people. How early, you know, when does death happen that you can take uh, an organ to transplant it um, and issues like that. But, uh, you know, otherwise, so I think if you had asked any Jewish legal scholar, they would have said there's absolutely no restrictions and that's universally accepted. And then we discover in the news uh, here that um, there is uh, serious epidemics of measles in some of the ultra-Orthodox yeshivas in um, uh, in New York City, 60 from or 40 from one particular yeshiva and 300 in the last few months in New York City and Rockland County, um, the vast majority of them from ultra-Orthodox yeshivas. And I think most Jewish scholars, even in the Orthodox community, weren't aware that there was resistance um, uh, to uh, vaccinations um, in this. And the vaccination issue, obviously, in Washington State and other places in Idaho um, has become a big issue. Um, uh, uh, again here. Uh, so I wanted to ask you or just uh, your reflection on that controversy, which is not just here in the United States, but there are significant areas in the world in which there's resistance for, to uh, vaccinations. And just whatever reflections you had about the vaccination um, uh, controversies that are going on. Well, I started with them and then moved on to children dying from preventable illnesses. But actually, the vaccination uh, question, I mean, that map, which I'm going to go back to it for just a second. You know, we don't, the state has an interest. Every single one of us have an interest in what is happening with vaccination policy. Um, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bracket for a second and, and, and just say that, you know, I don't know. I don't subscribe to the view that vaccination is leading to autism just from the bit of reading that I've done with that with my biomedical ethics class. So let's bracket whether there is some countervailing harm to children and how people view that. But there is a significant risk if you don't have herd immunity, right? Not only to you and your own child, but to everybody else around you. And that's what happened with the tabernacle, uh, the tabernacle group that Paul Offit talks about in his chapter, and then he talks about in his book, Bad Faith. And people would present at these homes. They, uh, to talk, to, to, to address your point about what specifically can be done in that time, at that time with the public health crisis, they literally had the ability to take children out of those homes. They went through the process, public health process, to be able to take children from those homes. They didn't always do that. Had they done that, there would have been other children who would have, would have been uh, vaccinated. Basically, the problem is once you don't have the vaccine and you have measles, measles, you have a terrible case of dehydration. The dehydration takes a bit of time before that child dies. Totally preventable stuff if they had gotten them into a hospital. So I think when it starts to unfold, state has an absolute interest in getting in there and taking these children and getting them treated. But the rest of the community has an interest in what is happening in those families. That's actually different than the faith healing. And I hate to be crass about it, but, you know, in these communities, right, when we have faith healing, there is a child, that child's gone forevermore, but it's just that child. It is not then contagion. Um, that is not going to be localized only to the Orthodox community, but to everybody that they come in contact with, too. So I skip past the, 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 the vaccinating vaccination in a way because lots and lots of people have talked about it, and I think not thought as much about this. Um, but there's a stronger interest by the state uh, to say you will vaccinate your children. But that, that map that I showed you, came directly out of the 1984 child abuse amendments where the federal government said to the states, we will withhold your child abuse and neglect dollars unless you give these medical exemptions, right, including the exemption, uh, you know, the ability not to vaccinate for religious reasons. 
Yeah, the religious exemptions. And then we've been in a slow process of backwalking them when it comes to faith healing, backwalking them to some limited degree when it comes to vaccination. And meanwhile, lots and lots of people are at risk. There are a lot of issues around vaccination internationally, uh, as well as other medical, but I want to focus on something that came up in an earlier discussion, which are these are issues largely of trust. They're not anywhere near as much issues of the religious uh, beliefs. Uh, so in the Ebola crisis, some of the um, health experts who went into communities were killed. Uh, because there was such a profound distrust of their own government. Uh, the cases in Nigeria and Pakistan uh, where there is opposition to uh, smallpox uh, vaccinators, um, it, particularly in Nigeria, but I think also in Pakistan, it's to a large extent one of the bigger problems that we're all dealing with, which is profound international distrust. So in this case, the West uh, and the evils of what are the motivations, uh, the the rumors that, um, for example, in Nigeria that the that the polio vaccine ha would um, sterilize women, that it was again designed to limit the numbers of of Muslim. So I think that in some ways, when you look at it internationally, you have to come back to these issues of awful governance, and corruption and the, the mistrust of states and some the, the imperative of trying to rebuild confidence, which is a challenge as much here as anywhere else, but also of trying to heal some of these uh, deep divides uh, that we paper over sometimes. There have been some there have, there have been some examples of where religious leaders got together to actually try and push back against that successfully and create uh, working with the governments there um, uh, the the stamp of approval of their members to do it. So the religious community can play a very positive role in such circumstances, not just a negative role. So, listen, thank you very much uh, here. This is it's a fascinating subject, and your book is a real contribution here. Congratulations.